that, whatever. All right. Um, can you please state your name, branch of service, and uh, retired rank? My name is Kenneth H. Rowland. I'm retired from the Army after 20 years. And you what, what else you want? A uh, branch of service. I was in the Army. Retired rank. Um, wh where and when were you born? I was born in Illion, New York, uh, May the 2nd, 1923. <clears throat> um, what was your pre-service occupation? Pre-service occupation? <clears throat> I was a truck driver for the Olean Lumber Company. Um, uh, were you drafted or did you uh, want I, to go into the I Army? I volunteered because I wanted to go. Um, did the Pearl Harbor attack influence your decision? Yes. It did? Because Pearl Harbor happened on a Sunday and I was uh, hunting over in Schuyler with my brother-in-law and I went to the car because it was cold and I heard on the radio about Pearl Harbor being bombed, and I told my brother about it when he come back to the car. He said, well, it must be a story. I said, no, it's the truth. So that was Sunday. The next day, I was already on my way up to Utica with some of my cousins and friends. We all come up and joined either Army, Navy, Marine Corps, whatever we wanted. We went into it. Wow. Um, where did you receive your basic training? Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Um, what was your initial unit? Uh, field artillery, 802nd field artillery, they call it. Um, what were your general duties and skills and ratings? Well, everybody had to be uh, infantry trained. In fact, the basic training you had to take, I've forgotten how many uh, weeks it was at that time. <clears throat> but we, we all had to take uh, basic infantry training. That's with rifle, machine guns, carbines, uh, hand grenades, the whole works. You have to go through all the basic. And while I was in basic training, uh, I've never had pneumonia until I went down south. So about four weeks into my uh, first uh, basic training, I caught pneumonia and went in the hospital for about a month down there. When I came out, I had to start basic training all over again. But then uh, my, uh, actually my duties were as uh, I was in communication section as well as uh, being a jeep driver for our battery commander, which is our captain. And uh, I was able to operate uh, radio, uh, voice speaking radio. I wasn't very good on the Morse code, uh, you know, with a diddy dot diddy yeah. with a key. <laughs> I was no good at that. In fact, uh, I'd fall asleep doing it. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I used to uh, go out sometimes, even in combat, have to help lay a uh, telephone lines and like that. Other than that, uh, my duties most of the time was driving this captain and being his radio operator. How long did you say, how long did it take you to complete your basic training since you had to go through it over again with the ammonia? If, I, if I'm not mistaken, it seems to me it was something like nine weeks at the time, the, the original, but then like I say, I had to take it over again, all over. <laughs> um. What would you have rated your uh, training and your equipment? What? Like, how would you have rated your equipment and stuff that they had? For that time, I would say it was just about the best. Yeah. Compared to today, I mean, <laughs> it was nothing, though. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, what was your first base you were stationed on? Uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Um, do you have any combat experience? Yes. How so? Pardon? How so? Like, what did you do? Like, were you well, actually, like, in combat? Uh, you probably know that uh, invasion of France was on June 6th, right? Yep. June 6th, I was in the United States yet. In fact, I didn't leave the United States, New York Harbor, until uh, 4th of July of the same year. And then I went over to, uh, we landed in Scotland. Took a train from Scotland down through uh, England in, over to Wales, and that's where we uh, received all of our equipment, trucks and guns and everything else, artillery pieces. And then we drove from there over to Southampton and got on the boat and went over into France, which was only about, well, in fact, our, we first went into battle about, about the end of July, I think it was, somewhere around there. A little over a month after the invasion. Uh, how did you keep in touch with your family? 
uh, when you were overseas. Writing and letters, and uh, during that time we had what they called a V mail. We we'd write a letter, and then they'd make a copy of it, and uh, it would only be a little small thing like that. You, I might have a, a letter that long, but they'd make a photocopy of it and send it, what they called a V mail. I don't know if you ever heard of that or not. No, that's the first time I've heard of it. Yeah. Uh, did your family support your decision in going to the military? Oh, yes. Well, my father was kind of sorry that he signed for me because he says if anything happens to him, uh, it would be his fault. But it didn't happen. I never, I, I actually uh, never uh, felt that I wasn't coming back home. I always had a, I always said in my mind, I says I don't think the Germans got a bullet with my name on it. Good, that's good. Uh, um, what was your most memorable? experience as far as military goes in combat or in uh or what uh, all together just in the military anything your most favorite memory about it well the, the advanced training before we went overseas we had to go through some uh, extensive uh training there crawling under bob wires with machine guns firing over the top of you actually the, the machine guns are mounted so they can't swivel or anything like that so you got to figure you're probably about 18 or 19 inches just below the uh, the bullets going over you and you're crawling under bob wire and if you get your clothing caught on the bob wire or anything like that if you tried to raise up you could get a hit with a bullet so they were real bullets too so oh, you yeah. could have gotten oh, killed yeah. if you stood they, up they, too they, ma they made you know that that's the way the real thing would be like but uh i went through a uh, basic training in fort bragg and from there they moved uh me down into Fort Benning, Georgia, and uh, we were what they call uh, school troops. We had 105 howitzer uh, guns that we'd fire demonstrations. The fellows who was going to be infantry officers were sitting up on the bleachers, and then they could look over uh, onto a hill over there. As the artillery would fire onto the hill over there, you'd see the infantry moving up behind it. As the artillery would raise up, the infantry would follow right up behind it. But we did have uh, an incident. Well, in combat, you never have your guns so close together. This time here in training, we had two uh, guns, uh, two 105 howitzers, almost uh, wheel to wheel. That's how close they were. And uh, there, we uh, ran into some uh, sabotaged uh, ammunition. We had what they uh, call a muzzle burst. Just as soon as the gun fired, come out of the tube, it burst. We had. Uh, Two gun crews. There was, uh, I think it was about five or six in each crew. Uh, they got wounded pretty bad. In fact, one fellow was an Indian fella. He got hit in the stomach with shrapnel. And when they rolled him over to put him on the stretcher, they had to pick up his intestines and lay him on top of him wow. to take him to the hospital. That guy got fixed up and went overseas with us. Really? Yep. Jeez. Are you still? Uh, do you still keep in touch with some of your friends from? I have. A, Last one I kept in touch with was about last week. I called uh, one of the fellows that's in the picture there. He's uh, retired and became a minister down in uh, Georgia, down Douglas, Georgia. And I called him two or three times a year, and then I have another friend that lives in Tampa, Florida. And when I travel, uh, I used to travel. In fact, I was down that way a year ago uh, this uh, last summer. I uh, took a plane, went down as far as uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and then rented a car from there and drove all the way through Georgia, all the way down to through Florida, Florida there, to see some of my buddies. So, like I say, I do keep in touch with them. But one of them used to live right up in Oswego, and he was a he was a mail orderly in my outfit. He would go back to the rear echelon, <coughs> pick up the mail, and then bring it up to the front lines. But he got wounded on uh, New Year's Day. New Year's Day, right, day after uh, Battle of Algy, he got hit with a dive bomber. He didn't get killed, but he ended up uh, being blind oh. in one eye. And when he walked, the nerve uh, in his uh, leg uh, would pick his leg way up in, his, in the air like that. And uh, he used to always tell me, he says, Ken, when you walk with me, walk on, on my right. He says, because I can see you with that eye, but the other eye I can't see you. What's a dive bomber? That's a, the Germans had uh, the Stuka dive bomber, the ME-109. Uh, 
They were a plane that could uh, travel real fast. In fact, that was the two fastest planes they had in World War II there. They would dive either on your area or whatever target they wanted to dive at. They'd dive down and have the plane aimed right at the target and drop the bomb off there. Either that or the spray them with the, I think they had 37 millimeter uh, cannons on some of them, on the nose of them. Wow. Um, what did you think of the, the food and how, what were the supplies like? To tell you the truth, being in the artillery is a lot different from being in the infantry. In the infantry, you talked about K rations, C rations, and like that. The infantry uh, lived mostly on that. Sometimes they would uh, be in an area where they could have the uh, uh, C rations that swarmed up in a big uh, kettle of water. So little round cans about that high. And uh, in our outfit, we had uh, the mess truck. We called it mess truck. In fact, I'm the leader of my uh, captain uh, I drive for. I'm the leader, lead, lead vehicle. The vehicle always right behind me was a kitchen truck, just to make sure we were close to it. Not only that, but that's the way they had it set up. I'd be first in line, and then the kitchen truck would be right behind us. We had big stoves there, and they could set up the stoves out in the field there, and within a very short time, they could have a meal warmed up and cooked for you. Uh what dates were you stationed in Europe? What was the date? Uh, let me see. It was about about the end of uh, July until uh, J July 44 until uh, November of 1945. Um, you traveled to many different countries, right? I tell my children I was in Scotland, England, Wales, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Germany. And I got paid for going. That's the way I told my kids. I got paid for going. In fact, my pay at that time, because I had over where I had three years, I was I had my three years. So after three years, you get a, a slightly raise. But uh, even with my uh, over three years and uh, being a corporal, I was only making eighty dollars a month. So you have no regrets about going to the military at all? Oh no, I'm proud of it. That's why I'm going around the schools and talking with all the people like you. Uh, what, what do you consider your most valuable award or medal that you received? Well, I never got, you can't see it. I got a little scar here and I had another one over here. I got a couple pieces of shrapnel and I had to go to the hospital just to have it stitched up because it's bleeding pretty bad. I was only in the hospital for one day just as soon as they stitched me up and re released me, I could go back to my outfit. But while I was waiting to be released, this colonel come down through with a big box like this and he throw in these purple hearts on the bed. When he came to me, he threw one on my bed and I called him back. I said, sir, what's this for? He said, you get wounded from enemy action? I said, yeah. He said, well, that's what it's for. I said, yeah, but sir, I just got stitches in my hand. This kid next to me, he's got a leg off. He gets the same thing as I do, and I refused it. But if I'd known at the time, it would have gave me five extra points to come home with. Not only that, I'd be able to join a group, uh, what they call a Purple Heart Club. But I never got that, so thank God anyways. Uh, how did you receive that injury? On your hands? Yeah. The, shri uh, the shell uh, dropped in the area there, and I had a couple pieces of shrapnel hit me in my hand. Uh, how old were you when you finally got home from uh, Europe? Let me see. 19, I come home, uh, yeah, 1945. So I was 23 years old. Uh, what was the welcome like when you came home and your family saw you? My family, uh, they knew I was coming. But the whole thing is they didn't know where and how, how I was going to get home or anything. When you get discharged from the service, and normally uh, back at that time, I don't know about now, but back at that time, they give you so much money for travel. I didn't use that for, uh, to pay for my travel. I hitchhiked from uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Hitchhiked, and I got two rides between there and Herkimer. I got two rides, took me all the way into Herkimer. So uh, I come home with all that money. I, mean, I think it was something like $200. <laughs> 
Um, do you belong to any veterans organizations? Yes, I belong to what they call uh, Veterans of Battle of Bulge, American Legion, and Disabled Veterans. What's that, the, what? the, the, the Battle of the Bulge organization? Can you explain? Battle of the Bulge? Yeah. Like this, is, this is the big battle. That, this is a medal here for the Battle of Bulge. Did you ever hear about the big battle where the Germans made the big breakthrough up in Belgium there? I think, yeah, I heard about it. Well, anyways, it happened uh, right along the border of uh, Luxembourg and uh, Belgium. Luxembourg is just a real small country. But right along the border there, <coughs> the Germans uh, had planned for a long time to make a big drive uh, to try to split the United States and the British and like that. So we'd uh, lose communications with each other. but. They uh, drove uh, probably about 40, 40 some miles, I think, into our line. And that's what they call the bulge. That line was pushed back about 40 miles. And they, uh, it's actually, it's called the uh, Battle of the Ardennes. That's the uh, name of the area there, Ardennes. Uh, and the Germans uh, went through there back in 1917, uh, the First War. They went through the same area again. But, anyways, uh, that battle started on December 16th, and uh, I was in 3rd Army at that time down in uh, what they call the Saar Basin, which is right on the border with uh, France and uh, Germany. Saar Basin was a big industrial and uh, coal mining area. We were down in that area when General Patton got orders uh, to take his whole 3rd Army, move it north about 120 miles to try to break up the Germans' uh, breakthrough there. So that's why they call it the Battle of Bulge, because it pushed our line, front lines back about 40 miles, I'd say. Um, what sort of World War II movies have you seen, like Flags of Our Fathers? Or Every one of them. What were your reaction to them when you seen the them? The one, uh, there's one there, I can't think of his name of it right now. But anyways, it was about the invasion of uh, France. And it was so authentic. Uh, to this day, uh, I can't even picture in my mind how they can make a picture like that and make it look like a guy's got an arm or leg off or his head all blown up and everything like that. It was in the picture. Uh, you probably heard, uh, heard the one, but I, that's one thing I forget names. Saving even, Private Ryan? Huh? Saving Private Ryan? Yes. Saving Private Ryan. That's one I couldn't think yeah, of. Thank you. Movie, You're helping my memory. <laughs> But that was very authentic. But the Battle of Bulge, I've seen it so many times that uh, I know it almost by heart what they're going to say. Did you see any like mistakes in the movie that they made, or was it kind of right on? Some of them, uh, there was some mistakes made. In fact, uh, actually, uh, a real mistake, in, in my opinion, was just before I got into combat, they had, uh, after the invasion of France, they had uh, a battle for a city they called St. Lo, that's in France. And uh, before they went in there with the infantry tanks and everything like that, they had the bombers come over and bomb the area really bad there. Some of the information got the wrong information to the bombers where the front lines were. The bombers, uh, one group, they uh, dropped their bombs too soon and they dropped it on our troops. In fact, uh, General McNair got killed there. He was right up the front lines and he got killed. And they have a amphitheater over in Marseilles, France, that are named after this general. Uh, what did you say the name of the general was that got killed? General McNair. Uh, what kind of a, like, what was his, like, how did you know him? I didn't was, know him, no. Oh. He was uh, over a different group. Most of the time I was with uh, Patton's Third Army. and. Uh, Right from the time uh, when I first went into combat with the 3rd Army, it was with the uh, 35th Division. You probably heard of ex-president uh, Truman, Harry Truman. Yeah. Harry Truman was in the 35th Division in World War I, and that was the division I went into combat when I first started. And uh, we were uh, with the 3rd Army, like I say, right up until uh, after the Battle of Bulge. Then they moved us all the way from Belgium you know where the Vosges Mountains are down in southern France? Uh, yeah. Yep. It's right on the border of uh, France and uh, Germany, and then we were only about 70 miles from Austria, I think it was. 
<clears throat> but that was a big battle after we win the Battle of Bulge. We were down in what they call the Comar Pocket. We were even fight, fighting alongside the British uh, First Army there. Or not the British, uh, French First Army. What a crazy bunch they were. They used to, <laughs> they used to have wine on, uh, on uh, all the time on tanks or trucks. They had wine. They had women with them and everything all the time. And uh, in one area, one road leading up to the front line at that time there, we couldn't get across this bridge because a tank went across the bridge and it was too heavy for the bridge and it dropped down into the creek. So we had to go around and drive through the creek in order to get where we had to go. <laughs> um, you said you fought alongside the British? No. Oh, you... No, it was a, I made a mistake. It was uh, the Fr French I was uh, meant to mention. Oh. Um... General Patton didn't have much, uh, much good things to say about the <coughs> British general. <coughs> well, I say a mar uh, Field Marshal Montgomery. I don't know if you ever heard of him. No. He was a head one of the British uh, troops there. In fact, he had some of the American divisions under him for a while too. <coughs> um, have you visited Pearl Harbor at all? No. You haven't been there. No. Uh, what about Washington D.C.? I've been there twice. Have you? Uh, what did you go see when you were there? Everything. In fact, I got probably some pictures in there, of different things about the monument. It's a beautiful monument, though. <clears throat> the only thing is it took too many years to put it up there because a lot of us died off before they got to see it. But I, I've been down there last year and the year before. Last year when I went down, I went down for one purpose, and that was to take a picture of the uh, monument that was made up in the, in the cemetery uh, of the Battle of Bulge. It's probably... Probably, well, in fact, when I stay inside of it, it probably comes up to my shoulder. It's probably a little bit longer than this table. And then it's got information there about the Battle of Bulge on it. Uh, what, what was your reaction and feelings when you saw the wall? What wall? Uh, the monument. Oh, that's beautiful, though. But uh, everything is, uh, in fact, uh, down there they got uh, two different sections. One is for the Pacific and the other one for uh, Atlantic. And uh, of course I was uh, in that section, uh, my outfit was in that section under the Atlantic because they have a, a big stone there saying a bad little bulge. And then uh, they had another, it was only a monument about that big, they had an inscription on there about the battle of bulge and that was the only uh, memorial that they had up until last May. Then they got this other big one down there. Um, how did your military experience change, like influence your life after? I think it taught me a lot more than uh, probably a lot of, I probably would have ever got if I stayed home. Because you got to stop and think now, back in the 1930s, I'm going back a long time ago, back in the 30s, it was shortly, you ever heard of the Depression? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I lived through that because the Depression started in 1929. So around in the 19 early 30s, my father put me on my aunt and uncle's farm up the other side of Rome. Like I told you, I went to a one-room schoolhouse up there. He put me on the farm up there to start working for my room and board when I was 14 years old. So by putting me on the farm there, I had to quit school. So I never went to high school. But I did. I did get a, one diploma from two years of college, though. And my, one of my granddaughters, how can you go to college if you didn't go to high school? I said, well, I finally found, I got the diploma yet. I went to Utica College. I took up what they call an industrial management course. It was a two-year course. So I, I, I'd done that, and I was right alongside of uh, superintendents and owners of companies, and uh, in fact, I can't think of a prof uh, the professor's name at the time. But anyways, uh, a very good teacher. And when it came time for uh, for diplomas, and uh, just like uh, any other diploma, when they hand them out, they have you stand up and they tell your name and what your job is and everything like that. I was the only one that was uh, actually a worker at the time. And everybody else was either managers or uh, owners or something like that. In fact, uh, 
one of the fellows uh, ended up being the owner of the company I worked for. I went to school with him up to Utica College. Here. <clears throat> um, did you visit any of the concentration camps? I was at, uh, I think I told uh, one fellow, you remember the name I told you of the concentration camp? Uh, I can't think of it. Was, in fact, it was probably about the first one that was uh, liberated. It was on Auschwitz. April the 13th or 14th. Pardon? Auschwitz? Oh, it was Auschwitz? Or? It was uh, right outside of Nordhaus in Germany. Huh? Buchenwald. Buchenwald. Buchenwald was the name of it. I was there the day it was liberated. And at that time, they had General Patton, all the big generals and Eisenhower and took all the uh, generals and uh, big shot officers over there and, and showed all these people laid out on the ground. It was all skinny and bones. In fact, I seen him carry one guy out. He was on a stretcher. But when his arm fell off the stretcher, uh, his elbow broke right through the skin. Jeez. That's how skinny he was. Wow. Uh, since you've been uh, retired, have there been other jobs that you've had that compared anywhere near to the military? No. In fact, after I come home, I was working in a bicycle factory down Little Falls. I worked there until I took too much time off to go up to Montreal to see my girlfriend. I got fired. <laughs> My, my first wife was from Montreal, Canada, and uh, then I went to work uh, at the Union Fork and Hoe Company in Frankfurt, New York. We made shovels, rakes, and hoes and stuff like that. We made all, all the hand tools and like that for uh, Sears Roebuck and W.T. Grant, other big outfits like that. Um, what are some of the awards that you got? Like, what were they for? This first one here is Victory Medal. This is what they call a Victory Medal. This is what they call a Good Conduct Medal. I never got an extra star or anything on that because I got busted one. So I got one one good medal, a Good Conduct. Can I hold it up for you so you can like show them? Yeah. Uh, you said you got busted once? Yeah. Uh, what did you do? I was taking the Morse code. Uh, I had. Uh, earplugs on and I was taking the Morse code and it was a really hot day down in uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia and uh, it was in the morning and uh, it was hot at the time so I was on the receiving part and the other fellow was uh, operating the key uh, transmitting I had to receive but I fell asleep or I started to doze off this sergeant came over and tapped me on the shoulder and he says come on roll get receiving a little while later he come back he just touched me, but he touched me here, and I'm very ticklish. And I threw my hand up like that. When I did, I hit the sergeant in the mouth. <laughs> so when I went in the office at 1 o'clock, come over to the PA system in the barracks there, corporal roll and report to the orderly room right away. I went over there and reported to the captain. And all, I, all it was said was, when I went in, I reported, to, as I was told, he says, I understand you hit a sergeant. And before I could say what happened, he says, that's all private, Roland. So I was a corporal, and I got busted down to a private. And that was probably a couple months before I went overseas. But then overseas in Germany, I got it back again. But this here is a American campaign and an American defense. Of course, this is uh, Africa, European uh, defense medal. Each star represents a battle that I was in. Counting the invasion of France, there's five battles. I, I missed that one, but I got the other four battle, battles there. Then this here is uh, occupation of Germany. We were occupied over there, occupied over there until the Russians took over. This is New York State conspicuous medal. And then this is the one is I'm most proud of is a uh, one for the Battle of the Bulge. And of course, this is my dog tags here. And each one of these bars is, represents six months in service. This one here represents three years in service. Every three years, you get one of these slashes. You've probably seen some sergeants with a whole string of them down their arms. Yeah. I only had one there during the war. But then I come home. 
let me see, December of 45, I come home, yeah. And I, I think it was about maybe three or four years after I was home, I joined the National Guards. That's when I got my 20 years and became a staff sergeant at, when I retired. But, but uh, like I say, this is um, the patch I'm most proud of, being with Patton, the longest of any. But this here was uh, the Seventh Army, and they call it the Seven Steps to Hell. Why? Why? Yeah. Because every step they took in battle there, they said they were in hell. <laughs> so that's what they put on the patch here, Seven Steps to Hell. Then this here is the 104th Infantry Division. They call it the Timberwolf Division. I was... Uh, attached to, or we were attached to that division towards uh, the end of the war, right up until we got pulled off the front lines. Um, what advice or words of wisdom would you give to people considering joining the military? My own personal opinion, I think everybody should serve at least one or maybe two years in service. It's a, it's a thor uh, type of training that I don't think you can get any place else. And you get to uh, prove to yourself that you can keep it, heap up with a guy right next to you. Doesn't matter if you went to school or not, you can still keep. Myself being the, one of the shortest ones in my outfit, my captain was short too. So the captain, when we marched, the captain was here and I was right behind him. You might as well say I was his shadow. But uh, in, base, uh, in training there, when you tra uh, train for before you go overseas, you've got to be able to carry your own weight. So in training, we'd have to uh, carry a guy our weight for 100 yards, then he'd have to carry you back. Whatever you weighed, you had another partner. One would carry him one way and the other would carry you the other way. The guys that weighed 200 pounds, they had a little bit harder trouble than I did. Oh, yep, that's, that's about it. Do you have any stories or anything you'd like to share with us, like any stories that, you know? Yes, I remember, well, well, it's quite a while before the Battle of Bulge. We're in uh, a city of Nancy, France, that's just outside of Metz. And uh, at that time there, we were so traveling so fast that our supply line couldn't keep up with, especially our ammunition and uh, gasoline. And not only that, but uh, this Field Marshal Montgomery, he had some kind of pull uh, that uh, he got the supplies sent to him more than to some of the other outfits there. So he was able to keep going, but the Third Army had to stop there. We were stopped there for probably almost two months because of a shortage of uh, ammunition and gasoline. But uh, during that time there, they were giving out passes to uh, what are the towns or city right nearby. And in fact, I went on past to Nancy, France, which is a pretty good sized town there. And then the city of Metz. That city there was completely surrounded with a wall. In fact, uh, the Third Army, I think, would probably was the uh, first time that uh, any walled uh, city like that has ever been taken over by an enemy. And they had a lot of underground factories and everything right in that built, uh, area there. But during that same time there, I think it's about the only time I really cried uh, during the war. and. Uh, <coughs> We were in this area right near where Nancy was there, and uh, the Germans were shelling us with uh, some 250-pound uh, bombs, or shells, whatever you want to call them. And do uh, you know what a slit trench is? No, I don't. It's a trench about that wide, probably about from here to this fella long. That's where your latrine was. You'd straddle a straddle a trench there and do your uh, job and like that. And uh, where they dug that trench there, whoever dug it, they had to, <coughs> excuse me, had the dirt pile all around them, you know, so they cover up the after. But anyways, the Germans were uh, shelling that town that time. And uh, a shell dropped so near where that dirt was that I got hit in both legs. I, I started running like hell into the guys. I said, help me, help me, I got wounded. They said, where? I said, my legs, look, look. I got hit with shrapnel. It wasn't shrapnel, it was the mud hit me in the back of my legs and I got so scared I started crying. I said, help me. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add? 
then that, that's about it's it. Yeah. Pretty good. But uh, I have been to uh, Dente School in Rome. I've been to New Hartford School, high school. I went to there. I've been to uh, one school in uh, Utica, Kernan School. I've been to West Frankfurt School. And I went down to St. Uh, Gloversville, where my daughter-in-law is a teacher. I went down there and talked to her classes two different times. So between me and one other fellow, we go around to different schools like that. West Frankfurt School puts on a real good program every year for us. They say it's what they call it, the salute to veterans. Not just for World War II, but for all veterans. But they put on a very good program every year down there. Yeah, all right. And then that's pretty much all the questions we have. Well, if there's anything else you want to ask, I mean, uh, I, I'm in no hurry or anything, because I have no place to go. If you want to talk some more about your experiences, go ahead. About the what? Your experiences and more, like, what, your more stories would be good if you had more. Well, there are different things. In fact, I got to tell you one story. Uh, it re was really shocking to me because at one time I was up to be uh, shot for uh, leaving my post without being relieved. What it was, when we when we went into France, we went in uh, on D-Day, and uh, I say we, the United States Army. And then later on, they had another invasion in southern France that came up troops from Italy come up into southern France and then they were supposed to make contact with the third army where I was. Well during that time there they told us to be on the watch out because the Germans are being pushed straight towards us, <clears throat> be on the lookout all the time. Well everybody pulls guard duty especially uh, privates and corporals and like that. Well, I was a private at the time and uh, I was on an outpost on a 50 caliber machine gun and uh, the corporal uh, that was with me, his name was Lonnie Wargo. I will never forget him. <laughs> but anyways, uh, he was a corporal. And uh, we had, you know what, the pup tents we had where two could sleep in the pup tents? Mm -hmm. Well, him and I uh, were uh, out on that outpost there, quite a ways from the rest of the outfit. But we were on a 50 caliber machine gun watching for the enemy if they're coming. But anyways, when it came in the morning, we had to take turns going down for breakfast. The corporal said to me, he says, uh, Ken, why don't you go down first and have breakfast and then come back and relieve me? I says, okay. So he's setting up a tent when I left, and he was putting his uh, shoes on. A little while later, one of the officers come up checking the outpost, and this outpost where I, I was with the corporal, he had fallen back to sleep. So when the officer found him and sleeping, he says, uh, where's your... Uh, partner with you. He said he went down to breakfast. So they had it down that I, I left my post without being relieved. And in combat you could be shot for it. They had me up for a general court martial and I was to be shot. But uh, what happened was this corporal had got caught once before sleeping and one of the officers come out is what saved me. Another officer says I caught this same fellow sleeping before. He says I believe Roland what he said when he, he was awake that it was all right for him to go, but the corporal being ranked over me, they they believed him more than they would be. So anyways, I was up for a court, general court, court martial, probably right at the beginning of the war. Can people still get uh, put a, like shot? Oh for, yeah. yeah, still today? Yeah. You're not allowed to leave your post, uh, especially uh, under enemy conditions like that. But. Uh, now, you probably heard about this uh, fellow that was supposed to be a star football player and he uh, joined the service. Tillman? Yeah, Tillman. Yep. yeah. There's a case there. I can't figure out what happened there. But anyways, he got uh, shot not once but three times in the head by his own men, by some of his own men. How could anybody shoot another one three times in the head? And then uh, the whole thing is what it was. That for some reason or another, because he was so uh, such a name person, though everybody knew him from. He was supposed to go to college, be a big football star, and uh, for a long time. In fact, it's just uh, lately now <coughs> they're bringing out the. There's going to be some, probably sergeants, officers, right on up to generals that's going to pay for that, killing that fellow there. 
we had one fellow before we went overseas, he didn't want to go overseas. He, for some reason or another, I guess he was afraid. So one night while he was on guard duty, of course, in the, even in the States at that time, you carry uh, live ammunition. But uh, he put the rifle right down on the, the instep of his foot and fired a shot off, blew a hole in his foot. And uh, of course, he never went overseas with us, but you cannot do any damage, in fact, if you go to hospital, say, you know, you know how a lot of guys, especially in the uh, uh, Marines and uh, Navy, they get a lot of tattoos? Mm -hmm. You cannot do anything to your body where if you have to go to the hospital, they can court-martial court you because they call it destroying government property. Wow. Your government property, and you belong to the government, you cannot destroy yourself. So whenever you do something like that, you're all done. <clears throat> well, we had a fella in our outfit during the war, well, it was almost time for the war, it was getting towards the end of the war. We had this one fella, a southern fella, and he was quite a drinker, and uh, he got uh, caught drinking. So he reported to Captain, and Captain told me, he says, I want you to go out and dig a hole six by six by six, six foot square, six foot deep. He says, I want you to bury that bottle that you're drinking from. I don't know how long it took him, but he buried the bottle and he reported to the captain. The captain says to, oh, by the way, what was written on the bottom of that bottle? He says, I don't know. He said, go find out. <laughs> this is some of the stories that you'll hear for something like that. But uh, we had one fellow, when he first went in service, he was in the infantry. Now, here was a guy, I don't know how he'd done it or how he got by the uh, inspection and like that. He was blind in his uh, right eye. He was in the infantry. Now, you fire right-handed, you have to have a good uh, right eye, right? He was blind in uh, his right eye, and he ended up in the infantry. He got wounded. He got uh, in a bayonet fight with a German, got his hand cut up real bad uh, for that there. So being with one eye, got wounded uh, real bad there. Instead of sending him back in the infantry, then they put him in my outfit, artillery, and that guy stayed right with us the rest of the war. Even though he was blind in one eye and got wounded, he still uh, stayed uh, in all the way through. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish up? Well, I don't know if you want to look at some of the material I got there. It's up to you. Um, yeah, we can uh, picture the pictures. Do you have any pictures? Yeah. I guess I can take this off so I don't pull it off or anything. Huh? How's this come off? Um, comes off. Come off. Yeah. So we good then? Are we good? Yeah.